and the series is in the Gospel of John. The title of the series that we will be dealing with is Close Encounters with God. As we read the book of John, we see that Jesus came in contact with a lot of people. And there was always a challenge and a transformation as he came in contact with these individuals. And so we want to look at the Gospel of John, and we want to look at these people that, that Jesus interacted with and, and see how that when uh, these individuals were interacting with Jesus, that Nicodemus, the woman at the well, the woman taken in adultery, the blind man, the impotent man, that when they interacted with Jesus, they were actually interacting with God. And to look at that and say, we have this incredible opportunity through Jesus Christ to interact with God. Father, we come to you this morning, and Lord, we thank you so much for the worship today. And Lord, we pray that it has prepared our heart to receive your word. And so, Lord, as we look at the introduction to the Gospel of John this morning, we invite the congregation to come and dine, the Master's calling, come and dine. You can feast at Jesus' table anytime. He who fed the multitudes and turned the water into wine, come and dine, the Master's calling, come and dine. Feed us, Lord, at your table today. For us in Christ's name, we ask these things. Amen. As we look at the introduction this morning to the Gospel of John, we see that the author, you know, we want to identify who is the author of this book. Now, as many books in the New Testament identify who the author is, the Gospel of John does not identify the author. So, with that said, we could actually be at a loss to know who actually wrote the Gospel of John. But there are three things that point to John the Apostle. The first thing is that the book in John chapter 21, verses 20 through 24, it is said to be written by the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, when we think about the disciple who Jesus loved, uh, the scripture is clear that the disciple whom Jesus loved is John, the apostle John. And so in those verses in the gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 20 through 24, it says that this book was written, that these things were written by the one that Jesus loved. The second thing is that the author was an intimate eyewitness to the life of Christ. And when we think about the life of Christ, that he had the multitudes that followed him, that he had uh, selected 12 that followed him, and of the 12, there was an inner circle, Peter, James, and John, who were the three that were in Christ's inner circle, inner circle, but there was one who was closer to Christ than anybody else, and that was the Apostle John. And some of the intimate details that we're going to study in the Gospel of John, we see that they can only be written by the Apostle John. And then the church fathers, those who would have known, uh, you know, who wrote the book uh, because they would have been intimately connected with that time period, uh, the church fathers actually attribute the Gospel of John to the Apostle John. Now, what is the date of the Gospel of John? So we're getting, we're getting this background introduction, uh, laying the foundation this morning. Uh, what is the date of the writing of the Gospel of John? Well, it is generally accepted that John wrote this book between 85 and 90 A.D. Uh, most scholars agree that that is the time of the writing of the book. But there is a number of individuals that will say the book was written a little bit earlier. They say that, well, actually the book was written before Jerusalem was destroyed in A.D. 70, and so they date the book uh, back to A.D. 70. Uh, we look at, next, we see 
uh, the Gospel of John. And here is an overview. This is an overview. So uh, I put this together. Uh, hopefully uh, you can see it, uh, a little light up there. But uh, when we look at, if you look at the top, uh, those are all the chapters in the book of John. Uh, there are 21 chapters in the book of John. If you, look, if you read verses 1 through 14, now I'm giving you an overview, right, of the book of John. So you'll leave here today and you'll have a good idea what's in the book of John, right? Uh, 1 through 14 is the prologue. And that says, in the, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it goes on for 14 verses talking about the deity of Jesus Christ encounters with God. That's what we're talking about. That John says that you are going to have an encounter with God in the book of John, and I'm going to start this book by telling you who God is. Jesus Christ, God of very God. And then chapter 1, verses 15 through 34, we see uh, John the Baptist is introduced. And then in chapter 135, all the way through chapter 12, Jesus ministers to the masses. He ministers. He's out there. He's healing folks. He's touching lives. He's uh, meeting the needs of people in, in chapters 1 through 12. And then in chapter 13 through 17, Jesus kind of slips away. And in four chapters, uh, he begins to minister uh, to his disciples. That, that no, no longer are the masses, no longer are the crowds, the focus of Jesus' ministry, but he narrows it down, and he spends chapter 13 through 17 just ministering to the disciples. Chapters 18 and 19, we see the crucifixion. Chapter 20, we see the resurrection, and then chapter 21, before he goes back to heaven, he personally ministers to the disciples again. Now, you'll notice, and this is very interesting, that when you read the Gospel of John, you'll notice I put a blue line right down the middle of it. The first th uh, 13, the, yeah, the first 12 chapters actually deals with three years. That it, 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 it talks about the ministry of Christ for three years. And notice this, that chapters 13 through 21 talk about the last few days of Christ. That, that the, the first half of the book deals with most of the ministry of Jesus, but the second half is boiled down to just a few days that he spends with the people here on earth. You'll notice that his audience, in the first 13 chapters, he has a public ministry. He's out and about. He's ministering to others. But we see in chapters 13 through 21, he has a private ministry where he's ministering to individuals privately. The place of the first part of the book of John was in northern Israel. You know, praise God, I had the opportunity to, to be in northern Israel and, and see a lot of places where Jesus ministered. But the, uh, the first part of the book of John is in northern Israel, around the Sea of Galilee, where he ministered for three years. And then the last few days, the second half of the book of John is in Jerusalem, where he's ministering in Jerusalem. Now notice this that the first part, chapters 1 through 12, deals with the miracles of Christ. And then, in chapter 13 through 21, deals with the messages of Christ. It shifts from the miracles to the messages. What is the purpose? What is the purpose? You know, a lot of books, you have to read the book and, and try to discern what the purpose is. But it's interesting. John tells you the very reason why he wrote. In chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, John tells you the exact reason why he wrote this book. There are four Gospels, and John said, this is the reason why I wrote my Gospel. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. So, you know, there are people that say, well, you know, Jesus did a lot of other things, how come they didn't get in the Bible? That shows you that they left stuff out of the Bible. Yeah, they left a whole lot of things out of the Bible, right? They left a whole lot. Jesus did way more than what we read in the Gospels. But these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
John said, the reason that I'm writing this gospel is because I want you to know more than anything else that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is not only the Son of God, but he's God, a very God himself. And I'm writing this so that you know and that in believing that you might have life through his name. And so this is the purpose. When we, as we study the book of John, we see that this is the purpose. Now, let me throw this out at you, right? And then we're going to move into something else. Uh, as I deal with the background material. Just think about the Gospels. And, and, and let me give you an overview of the Gospels. So when, when, when we look at when the writers wrote, you know, when Paul wrote, it was clear. You know, he wrote to the Thessalonians, he wrote to the Colossians, he wrote to the Corinthians. But sometimes we're as, not as clear as to who the Gospel writers, writers wrote to. But when you think about Matthew, his audience was primarily a Jewish audience. Mark, he primarily wrote to Gentiles, especially the Romans. Luke, who was a Gentile, Greek, he primarily wrote to the Greek, Greeks. And John, he wrote his gospel to Jews and Gentiles, to Christians, to, to, to people. Now notice, uh, in Matthew, Christ is, is presented as the king, the Messiah. In Mark, he's presented as a servant. In Luke, he's presented as a man. And in John, he's presented as God of very God. So what was John's emphasis? John's emphasis is what? I want to show you Jesus as God. When we think about the genealogies, and the genealogies are where they trace the history of, uh, of an individual. And so we have genealogies in Matthew and Luke. So I teach this in, uh, in, in Bible class when I, when I teach the Gospels, is that when you think about genealogies, where you, have to, where you trace the history or the, the genealogy of an individual, first of all, if you have a king, that somebody who uh, ascribes to the uh, kingship, that that individual has to have a genealogy. You can't be a king unless you have a genealogy. Look at England, and, and we see what was the big deal. Now, I'm trying to figure out what is the big deal about Harry and uh, what's, the, what's the lady's name? Uh, uh, Megan. Megan. I said, man, what is the big deal about them? I mean, everything stopped. All the TV shows and newspapers stopped because Harry and Megan uh, got married. Now, I, I, I want to say, I, I did watch for <laughs> I did, I did watch part of it. But you know what? There was a brother, uh, an Episcopalian bishop. This brother had the whole world watching him. He broke the gospel. I, man, I was sitting, because I was in Philadelphia. I was sitting in my hotel. I was about to shout. I said, man, I got to go talk to somebody. This, this brother, man, he preached the gospel. And I was like, man, you know, it's, if you, and you know what? What event? Was, was, was more watched around the world than that event. Man, God is powerful. God is powerful that he got his message out. And the brother, he didn't mince any words. He, he, he talked about the love of Christ and how Christ died on the cross. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was powerful. Now, how did I get to that? Oh. <laughs> it's, it's because, you know, wh why was that important? Because of the lineage, right? That that, that, that lineage... You know, the, 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 there's the potential that Harry or his children will actually end up, you know, ruling in Israel. And so a king has to have a, gene, a genealogy. A servant, hey, we don't care. Servant don't need one, right? Now, a man, because if you go back and look at Israel, the 12 tribes, they all trace their genealogy. So in Matthew, there was a genealogy. In Luke, there was a genealogy. In John, there's no genealogy. Why? Because God don't have one. <laughs> God don't have a genealogy, right? And so uh, we look at, you know, what was John's emphasis? It was on God. What are key words? Key words in the book of Matthew, the word kingdom is used over 60 times in the book of Matthew, over 60 times. Uh, the key verse in John is Mark 10:45. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. 
And that's where this idea of the servant comes from. Uh, in Luke, what is the key verse? The Son of Man is used at least 18 times in the book of Luke. And then in the Gospel of John, the phrase Son of God is used over 10 times. So why did I show you that? Because I'm trying to show that John's whole point was to present Jesus as God. And as we read his Gospels, we are reading people, reading about people who have had encounters with God. Jesus, to me, is, he's a person. He, I mean, I've been told he's the Son of God, but if I don't necessarily believe there is a God, then he may not be the Son of God. He's probably just a person who had some messages for people, who gave people hope and faith, I suppose, made them believe in themselves and each other. I believe Jesus was a person, um, probably similar to the Islamic belief that Jesus was probably a prophet, um, someone who had a very strong connection to uh, God or a higher spiritual being, but a lot of the New Testament, I believe, is probably more so stories giving us guidance on how we should um, perform and fulfill our lives. I think he was a real person. Um, I'm not sure about the Messiah part, but I think at least he was a prophet and he had some very important things to say. And uh, regardless of whether he was real or not, or just how real he was. The lessons that he teaches are extremely important for us to be to be civilized. You know, that's a whole goal with all of the religions and the governments and things like that is to make us all more civilized. So we're not killing one another anymore and, and having wars and things like that. We need to learn to get along. And um, that's, that would be the thing that makes us different from the rest of the animal world. So we can behave and can get along with one another, help one another, you know, compassion. That's, that really to me is the essence of Jesus. I do believe in Jesus, but I don't have a religion because in my opinion, sorry, it's my opinion, a religion for me is a kind of evil business. Because religion put children against parents, parents against children, the world against the world. If you take the history behind all the wars that you had, the religion was there in somewhere. So I think, in my opinion, you have to say yes to Jesus and don't let the religion take over control of your mind. I think that Jesus came to earth in a man, fig man figure. And I do believe in him, like, but I think that his love, only about love, he doesn't judge you like because your color or sexuality or what else you be. I just think that Jesus is love. I think Jesus was human, and I think, I don't know, maybe for, for my explanation for myself is that he was just a super smart person. I mean, people said he was the healer and everything. I think he had just more answers to questions that other people didn't have. I also think he's, he was human, but I think he was like just like really nice and as she said, like really smart and stuff. But I don't think he has nothing like supernatural. I'd have to say Jesus was a good man. Uh, I'm not sure if he was God or not. I can't really compare Jesus to anyone because maybe it's a bit to Gandhi, but that's about it. I can't really compare Jesus to anyone else because he was doing his own thing and you know, his uh, teaching, so to speak. To me, Jesus is the son of God. Uh, Jesus is, I guess, a character in a story, but it represents something really good, I suppose. I don't doubt that Jesus was actually a person, like he, he lived, but whether he was a Messiah or a son of God or anything, I don't know if I necessarily believe that. Um, but yeah, he represented good things. He gave people faith and I guess that's a good thing. So we can see the word on the street, right? That Jesus is not God. So when you think about the word on the street and that Jesus is not God, it becomes even more critical when the word in the church is that Jesus is not God. 
And if you talk to some people, I mean, that are in the church, that grew up in the church, you know, they, they are beginning to question whether Jesus is God. And if we, as the, the followers of Christ, the believers in Christ, if we just believe he was a prophet, or if we just believe he was a good man or a good teacher, then, you know, because, you know, some people, that's, that's why when people say they believe in Jesus, you got to listen to them real close because I need to understand what Jesus you're talking about. Because Jesus to certain people is not the same concept. So just because somebody gets up and, and talks about Jesus and say that they are a follower of Jesus, you listen to them very closely. Because if they come short of saying that Jesus is God of very God, then they got some issues theologically. And so we see that there's a, there's a growing problem in, in, in our society. That you, know, you notice that uh, the, the older people you know, have a tendency to gravitate more toward the belief that Jesus is God. But when we move through the generational issues that I guess either it's not that important as, as time goes on, or, you know, that again, there's a lot of uh, uh, people that are receiving information on the college campus, and that's why we need to pray for the young people that are going to the college campuses that they continue to maintain their faith and their hold and their grip on the Word of God and on the truths of the Word. Because there are individuals there that want to shake them to their very core. They want to shake the belief of, of all that they've learned growing up. They want to shake their belief in the fact that Jesus is God. And so maybe that's the reason why, you know, we're seeing this drifting away. So this series that we're doing, you know, we're going to talk about how real Jesus is. You know, we sing the song, real, real, Jesus is real to me. And not only is he real to me, but he's also God of very God. When we look at the book of John, in the gospel of John, we see the I am's. There are the, the I am's. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection of the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. Jesus gives the, the I am's in John. Now you say, well, what's important about the I am's? Because if we go back to the Old Testament, in Exodus, uh, Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14, when Moses went to God at the burning bush, and, and Moses said, well, well you know what, I'm going to go out here, and I'm going to try to lead these people out of Egyptian bondage. When I go to them, who shall I say sent me? <laughs> and God said, tell them, I am sent you. I am. I am what? I am whatever you need. <laughs> whatever they need. I am. I, you know, I, I, I am it. You know, I, I am he that was, that is, and he that shall be. I am. I am the eternal one. I am the self-existent one. I am the sovereign one. You tell them that I am sent you. <laughs> and so Jesus comes in the New Testament. And he gets into a discussion in John chapter 8 with the religious leaders of the day. And they're bragging about the fact that Abraham is their father. And Jesus said, uh, before Abraham was, I am. You see why they wanted to kill the man? You know, you, you, you remember that one time? They, 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 went, they, they went after Jesus, and they was pushing him, and they was getting ready to throw him over a cliff, right? They, 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 he got to the precipice, and they were getting ready to throw him over a cliff. And the Bible said that he just turned around and walked through him, and they didn't even know where he was at. Well, why did they want to kill him? They wanted to kill him because he was proclaiming that he was God. And not only did Jesus proclaim that he was God, you know, it's one thing to run your mouth, right? You know, we all ran into people when we were growing up uh, uh, that liked to talk. And, and, you know, sometimes guys like to, to sell, I call them wolf tickets, and, and, and talk a good game because they knew they had a brother, a big brother, that could back them up, right? <laughs> right? 
They knew, they knew they had somebody so they could run their mouth, right? So you, you, can, you can run your mouth. And, and Jesus can do all this, t- this talking about I'm God, right? That, that you know, I'm, I'm, I, I, I am the Messiah. I am the eternal one. I am the bread of life. I am. Oh, he could have ran his mouth about all that, right? But guess what? Jesus had a big brother to back him up. And his big brother was the miracles that he did, right? He, I mean, and we're going to look at that in the, in the Gospel of John, is that, that these miracles that he did. So uh, I just want to close the message out uh, this morning by just talking about a few individuals who had a close encounter with God. And, and, and the show, because I know that as, as I'm sharing this message, that some of you are sitting there saying, what in the world is he talking about? Encounter with God. You know, I, I have a lot of young people that come up and, and ask me questions, and one of the questions that I'm often asked by young people is, Pastor, you said that, you know, you talk to God. You know, I, I, I have no concept of that. I, you know, I mean, it, it just makes, it's, it's foreign to me. It's, you know, I have no idea what you're talking about when you say that you're talking to God. What, what does that mean? And so, I, you know, I realize that, you know, even as I go through this message, that there has to be a practicality in it so that people can see that a relationship with God is tangible, that a relationship with God is intimate, that a relationship with God is personal, but more than anything else, that a relationship with God is possible. And we see in the Gospel of John people who had close encounters with God. Let's look at, real quick, Nathaniel. Turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. In verse 45. It says, Philip findeth Nathaniel, and said unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Hey, man, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Can any good thing come out of Braddock? Can any good thing come out of Homewood? Right? And, and I like Philip. You know, if you ask, can any good thing come out of Braddock? Somebody asked you, just say, come to Bethany and see. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> right? Jesus, <laughs> Jesus said, see, the reason I said that, because I know when I say stuff like that, it sticks better. Right? <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> Philip said, come and see. You know? Come, come and see. Uh, and Nathaniel, uh, Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him and said unto him, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile or no deceit. Nathanael said unto him, How knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before Philip called thee, when thou was under the fig tree, I saw thee. And Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, teacher, thou art the Son of God, and thou art the King of Israel. That Nathanael met a Jesus who knew all about him. Have you met that Jesus today? Have you met that Jesus that that saw you when you were under the fig tree before you even knew about him? Have you met that Jesus when in the lonely hours of the night when there's nobody else around and and you are left there with your thoughts? And I, I often ask the question, when unsaved people that don't have a relationship with God, when they wake up in the night with all their problems, with all their tribulations, with all their trials, who do they cry out to? Thank God I have a Jesus who knows all about me. Nathaniel, before I even... Before you even met me, when you were sitting under the fig tree, I knew all about you. That's the kind of God that I want to interact with. I want to interact with a God who who knows me, who knows my ups, who knows my downs, who knows my weaknesses, who knows what makes me laugh, who knows what makes me cry. That's the Jesus that knows us. That's the Jesus that we want to encounter. Peter found that. He is a God who has the words of eternal life. 
Just think back to the people on the video. Just think back. I, I don't think, I, I think there was a guy on there that said he believed that Jesus was the Son of God, and they kept him on there for about three seconds, yeah. right? <laughs> and all the rest of them had no concept of who Jesus is. John chapter 6, and I like John chapter 6 uh, because Jesus' message started getting hard. Uh, Jesus started talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And when he started talking that, you know, uh, what he basically was saying, I'm getting ready to go to the cross. And unless, you know, you are willing to give your life up, that you can't be my disciple. And, and the message got hard. As long as Jesus was making fish sandwiches, the people was with him. <laughs> but look what it said in John 6, 66. When he started talking about making communion sandwiches, there was a different thought. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Remember that, John 666, 666. I don't know why that sticks in my mind, maybe because of Revelation 12, all right? John 666, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus <coughs> unto, uh, said unto the 12, will you also go? Are you going to? I mean, can you imagine? Jesus is standing there. The message is getting hard. And he's just watching people leave him left and right. I mean, they're just, they're just leaving in masses. And then, you know, it's kind of like the, the 12 are like the only ones left. <laughs> and Jesus said, are you going to? Are you going also? And, and, and notice, then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Wow. He had, a, he had an encounter with God. This encounter with God gripped his life. And when everybody else was leaving and Jesus asked him, was he going to leave? He said, where are we going to go? Where are we going to go? Only you have the words of eternal life. The bartender don't have the words of eternal life. Oprah don't have the words of eternal life. Dr. Phil don't have the words of eternal life. There's only one person that has the words of eternal life. And Peter recognized that it was God of very God, that he had the words of eternal life. And he said, where are we going to go? Do you recognize, have you recognized the fact that Jesus has the words of eternal life? If you do, when was the last time you read his book? If you do, when was the last time you, you, you sat in a study where you were taught the word of God? If you believe that Jesus has the words of eternal life. Martha, Martha, let me hit, let me hit this, these last two and I'm through. Uh, Martha, that's the preacher way of saying, hang on, I still got about 20 minutes left. You know? I can see you fading, right? I can see you fading. So I'm down to my last two points. So then you can kind of perk up and, and tune back in, right? All right. Uh, Martha, Martha, John chapter 11. In, in, in John chapter 11, uh, verse 21. Uh, then this is, their brother had died. They sent message to Jesus that their brother uh, was dying. And then in uh, chapter 21, then Martha said unto Jesus, Lord, if thou had been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatever thou will ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said, you're looking at the resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me uh, shall never die. Believeth thou this? And she saith unto him, he asked her, do you believe this? She said, yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, who should come into the world. Martha saw Jesus as the one who could not only give spiritual life, but the one who was able to raise the dead and give physical life again. I'm talking about encounters with God. Encounters with God. 
everyday encounters with God. We live our life every day, and we should be in. We should encounter God at some level every day of our life. Nathaniel, Peter, Martha, these are just simple encounters with the master. And then the last one is Thomas. And that's found in John chapter 20, verse 24. After Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to the disciples, but Thomas was not there. But the second time, but Thomas, one of the disciples called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. But the other disciples therefore said unto him, uh, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger in the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, the disciples were inside, Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being opened, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach here thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach uh, my hand, and thrust it in to my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said, My Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. He had an interaction with the living God. And as I close this morning, I I, I just want to say that when we read the book of John and we go through the gospel of John, if you go to that next slide, when we go through the gospel of John, we see these interactions that Jesus had with people throughout the book, that they were changed. Nicodemus? changed. He was one of the ones that came and got Jesus' body after he was crucified. The woman at the well changed. The impotent man changed. The blind man changed. Lazarus changed. Put your name down there. Put your name down there. Have you encountered God? Have you had an interaction, an encounter with God? I like that song, a change, a change has come over me. He changed my life and now I'm free. He washed away all my sins and made me whole. He washed me as white as snow. He changed my life complete and now I sit, I sit at his feet to do what, I'm, what must be done. I work and work until he comes. A wonderful change has come over me. You can't come in contact, you can't encounter the living God, and not change. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be able to share the word of God. And Lord, as we open up the series with the introduction to the Gospel of John, Lord, help us to see what it means to interact with the, as as we read time and time again, the Son of the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so, Father, grip our hearts, change our lives, because we have contacted deity. Lord, we pray today, if there's someone here that has never received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that today they would come and give their life to this one who was able to bring change in a life. Lord, there's someone here today that's looking for a place to fellowship. This is the place where you have led them. We pray that they would come, Lord, as we give this invitation today. Now, Lord, we commit this time to you and ask that you would lead God in the rest. Of course, in Christ's name, we pray.